Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, middle of the night, whatever it is for you. I would like to welcome you to a SNEA Bright Talk presentation. This is how video analytics is changing the way we store video. My name is Jim Fister. I will be your moderator for today. Uh, before I introduce our other two, our two uh, key presenters, let me uh, address a few things on the Bright Talk platform. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. If you're not, uh, you can hover over the uh, Bright Talk uh, pre the slide screen that you see, and you'll see a couple of things that'll ghost up. One of those will be will enable you to actually expand the presentation to full screen, and that might be useful for some of the slides that we have. The slides are also available as an attachment, and you can see the attachments and links button uh, beneath the screen. Also under there is a question screen. We encourage you to submit any questions that you would like. And uh, please feel free to enjoy the presentation and make sure to rate us as well as provide comments. We take your comments very seriously and we use them to not only uh, uh, make our presentations better, but we welcome suggestions for how you'd like to uh, explore further on this topic or other topics that can be provided by SNEA. So again, as I said, my name is Jim Fister. I'm an independent contractor for SNEA, and I also run my, run my own company, The Decision Place. With me today are two very good presenters. First, Glenn Bowden, who's the CTA of IA and Data Practice for H. Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Say hi, Glenn. Hi everyone, thanks Jim. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. I've spent a lot of time working with um, artificial intelligence and doing a lot at the moment in the, the video analytics space. So this is a, a topic that's very dear to my heart. Yeah, and I noticed that they uh, just announced that they were moving HPE's corporate headquarters. Maybe you'll maybe you'll go to Texas a little more often once you can travel. And uh, also with us, Kevin Kevin Cohn from Intel. He's a media analytics segment manager. Say hi, Kevin. Hello everyone, look forward to this. I'm uh, kind of out of my element. I'm normally uh, not a storage guy, but uh, look forward to talking about some of the use cases for media analytics and how that might impact storage. We're all storage people today, everything's good. One thing we are not today though are the lawyers. Uh, unless they surprise me by getting a degree, neither Glenn nor Kevin, and certainly not myself, are, uh, are lawyers. We are not providing any legal uh, advice. So this is uh, contained, uh, this presentation is copyrighted by SNEA. Member companies, individual members may use this material. Uh, again, you can uh, download the attachment and you can reference this material in any way that you want. This presentation is a project of the Storage Networking Industry Association. Like I said, we're not attorneys. Nothing in this presentation is intended to be or should be construed as legal advice. And this is, while we're representing companies, this is our personal opinion. And so uh, take it as that. So no warranties expressed or implied. And we hope that you enjoy the presentation. If you're not familiar with SNEA, uh, SNEA is a, an industry body. Uh, we have 185 industry leading organizations participating in this. We have over 2,000 active and contributing members, and we reach over 50,000 IT store and storage professionals worldwide. We focus on storage and networking standards and are active in a variety of areas. Today, the SNEA Cloud Storage Technologies Initiative is your uh, hosting organization. SNEA focuses on education, uh, especially around cloud storage technologies in this case. We support and promote business models and architectures. We want you to understand what, it's, uh, what the implications are on cloud storage, and we want to collaborate with you and with others in order to make the industry better. So what I will do is I will hand it over to Glenn, who will start getting into the meat of the presentation. I will tell you, Glenn, I'm actually very interested in this. Uh, I've been a video guy for almost as long as you can be a digital video guy. I was uh, actually part of the team at Intel that was acquired from Sarnoff Labs that brought the first digital video to market. So when I first said, hey, AI analytics on video is just, uh, it's just a lot of image processing and you corrected me, uh, I'll be very interested in how it's different and some of the things that are going on. So talk about the old video platforms and where we're going from there. All right, thanks, Jim. And yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go back in time a little bit. So for those of you that aren't as old as I am or, or dealing with systems that are as old or older than I am, um, I want to have a look at, at where video came from and, and where the, the kind of architecture originated. Um, we'll then have Kevin talk about the, the benefits of video analytics and, and look at some really interesting and, and sort of um, spend the meat of the presentation looking at, at some of the use cases that we're seeing from video analytics. Um, we'll then flip back to me again to, to talk around what that means for an architecture perspective, particularly from uh, implications on storage. 
excuse me, um, but what, what the rest of the ecosystem looks like as it grows up. Uh, and of course, we can't talk about video analytics without touching on some of the security and governance pieces that, that kind of sit around that. So I'll, I'll touch on that towards the end as well. <clears throat> excuse me. So let's kick off with the old video platforms. Now, um, they still exist. So, so let's just kind of break down what the architecture looks like initially. So you have your, starting from the right-hand side of the screen, we have a fleet of cameras there. Now, uh, back in the day when we were looking at this sort of architecture, um, these were sort of typically mounted in useful positions around buildings or on vehicles, um, and they were connected usually via coaxial cable back into a, a video collection device. And that could be a VHS or tape recorder. Um, it could be an aggregation device of some kind that then split it off into both a recording device as well as into um, the, the live screens that an operator would look at to, um, to do their job. So if they were securing a premises, for example. Now, that storage media could be anything from uh, tapes to uh, a nightly dump onto a DVD or a CD, um, or it could be onto uh, sometimes it was being digitized and taken onto a, a digital device. Uh, but what we were getting was analog video, uh, usually quite poor quality as well. Um, and then you can see on the right, left hand side, we would then have to go through something like a video capture card to get a digital version of what we were producing. And then that would go into a video workstation where you could start doing something with it in a digital realm. So maybe mocking something up, highlighting certain frames, or even just storing it digitally. So you can see there's quite a sort of transition. Um, the tape and the, 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 the kind of media that you were recording onto and dumping onto originally um, would often get externalized by putting it into a big metal box called a safe, be that on your premises or be that somewhere else, usually a big fireproof thing. Um, and then you take it out once a week and, and either re go over the tapes again or check that the tape hadn't gone transparent in the years previously and that it was still useful. Um, so from a storage perspective, it was really very, very simple, but actually very, very difficult to work with. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this and the reason I'm going this far back is uh, even as part of my role today, looking at AI solutions that wrap around um, video analytics, I'm presented with systems like this, um, particularly on vehicles. So if you look at sort of public transport where they now have cameras on, uh, on the vehicles, so on buses, on planes, on, on boats, whatever it may be, um, it's usually a system like this. They haven't gone very complicated or they've been there for such a long time that it's an old system and it's an old analog system we now need to figure out how to digitize and do some work with. When we start looking at some of the use cases that we're beginning to see, you'll see that this isn't ideal. It's also not ideal from a training perspective because one thing that you, within AI, when you start doing training, you need to train on certain quality of images for starters helps. Um, and most of the models that you can pull down from the internet uh, when you start, start doing these things rather than building from scratch um, are already trained on, on certain quality digital video imaging. So if you start changing things against that, so you now have um, sort of monochrome images and you're, you're looking at um, much lower quality and you're looking at much bigger pixels and all those sorts of things, it's much less likely that the models will actually match. So if you're doing object detection, for example, it's much harder to detect the model than those old images because simply the, the blockiness of the pixels or the, um, the noise around the edges of those things just makes it very, very difficult to do any kind of identification. If you've ever seen them, it's even quite hard to do with your eyeballs. Um, so having a machine do it when it's been trained on good, high quality, high fidelity images is, is a very difficult thing to do. Um, then there's, of course, the fact of where it's coming from. If it's coming from tape safes um, into a tape recorder or a tape player and then back into the system, it's a huge ingestion problem. You have to rely on the fact that all of the tapes are actually there and then re-ingest it back into the system so that you can do some training on that and actually uh, get some useful information out of it. And obviously, the, the best answer is upgrade the, the fleet of cameras to be modern IP cameras, and we'll look at what that architecture looks a bit like later. Um, but that isn't obviously an option for everybody, and, and there's, there's phased approaches. So we're, we're coping with this type of architecture too. So this is kind of where we live, um, or where we used to live, if you like, and what the, the kind of simple thing was. And as I said, just to kind of summarize, it was all very analog. It was stored in very low resolution and very low fidelity. Um, they were often very noisy and grainy frames as well. And the noise would move. It's not like you have static noise that would just stay the same across every frame. Um, it causes a lot of momentum and a lot of movement within those frames as well. Um, often it was monochrome, or you wished it was in some case because the color gradients were so poor. Um, and the speed of medium to ingest is extremely slow. It, it, it's glacier, in fact, trying to get these off the tapes, um, with a lot of retrying as well. Uh, and there's- Well, and, on, and there's honestly, no Glenn- Sure, go ahead, Jim. And I, I was gonna say, and honestly, Glenn, you know, um, even if you say, well, I'm going to digitize this and, and have it ready just in case my, my algorithms improve that I can look at it, you're still storing uh, very low-quality, poor video at reasonably high resolution so that you can look at it later. And that is a uh, storage, it does have significant storage implications in your store farm. 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, spot on. Um, the other part as well, you mentioned at the beginning there around uh, video analytics being just a, a kind of a frame-by-frame -frame analysis. Um, actually, it's not, for the video piece at least, what we try to do is look at differences between frames as well and chains of frames. So if we're looking at object detection, we'll try and do that detection throughout a series of frames so that we can predict movement of an object. And if it's behaving in a certain way, we know it's the same object that's transitioning through that frame. When the frame itself is very noisy and grainy and you have all that animated dirt across the, the, the image, um, that becomes very difficult as well because you then start tracking things that aren't there and you get the ghosts and the artifacting and all sorts of other things as well. So um, all of that ends up making for a very poor compressible image too, which means it, again, inflates that storage piece. Uh, and the, the hardest part about doing that kind of ingest anyway is the fact that indexing used to be you would write on a little piece of cardboard and stick it to the box that your video was in or your, your disk was in. And so it's not easy to search unless you've got a human with their eyeballs looking through all of these things and then, then figuring what out, out what it was. And often if the card has faded or missing or misplaced, you again didn't really know what it was you were looking for. So being able to search these archives was, was pretty much impossible um, or a very laborious task as well. So what I want to do is, is hand over to Kevin who's going to talk to us around some of the new modern use cases and cheer us all up a bit from, from me making us uh, gloomy about the past. All right. Thanks, Glenn. So um, as I said in my intro, I'm, I'm not a stories guy, but I'm going to approach this from the lens of the use cases that we see on video. And I'm going to talk about two specific examples um, that come from a project that Intel is sponsoring but is now an open source called the Open Visual Cloud Project. And just as a, as a brief public service announcement, this is a project that uh, you can see the link here uh, on GitHub. It's a, a collection of use cases that um, have various applications across anything video. And what we've done here is to start to contribute the uh, libraries that really abstract the complexity of some of the underlying technologies and platforms from the user to allow the user to focus on those full end-to-end -end experiences. So um, we, we see commonality across all these use cases in video decode and encode rendering and inference. And so what we do is we abstract the complexity of how you decode, how you do decode, how you do encode um, from the user by encapsulating that with some optimized software libraries that are, again, all open source. You can see those referenced here. And then we show how to tie those together with end-to-end -end pipelines using, uh, again, open source platforms and frameworks like FFmpeg, GStreamer, and NGINX. And as I said, we've got a, a collection of these across several different experience domains. I'm going to focus on two of them today. One are smart city sample pipeline, and the other are library curation pipeline. Um, again, these are all open source. You can go to GitHub. You can download the source for these. Uh, you can play around with them. Uh, they are fully functioning apps, not intended to be full production applications, but as starting points for developers to see how to build end-to-end -end applications and pipelines. Um, although we have seen some customers use these as the starting points for the full application um, development by using these as middleware that they can build additional, more complex business logic on top of. So just a public service announcement there for our Open Visual Cloud project. The first and, you are accepting and you are accepting uh, contributions to the project, correct? Uh, we, we have contributions coming into the project as we speak. Um, so Excellent. yes, um, we kicked it off, but it is a full open source community. So the first uh, use case I'm going to talk about is what we call a smart city pipeline. And as you know, in many locations, cities around the world today, there is a growing deployment of monitoring cameras for monitoring traffic, monitoring people. This application shows an example of using those cameras to monitor traffic flow, both pedestrian, bicycle, and automobile flow. And we express that as a, a, a GUI with a map that you see there in the lower right-hand corner that shows uh, various cameras. In this case, it's, a, it's looking at a small section of a community where we've got five cameras that tie into one mobile edge computing uh, platform. Uh, and you're showing just heat maps of the, pop, uh, the traffic density around the, the intersections that those cameras are monitoring. Uh, this specific type of use case and workflow can be used by a city traffic planner to uh, plan uh, traffic flows, to plan where they're going to be deploying um, resources like, uh, like traffic lights or monitoring 
congestions during real time to, to look at what they might be wanting to do expansions. And it's uh, an example of the kind of impact that these smart city cameras are having on storage in that it greatly increases the amount of video that you're having to look at and that you're having to store. And so one of the things that we see happening is the use of automatic detection and classification so that you don't have to be worrying about storing video from the middle of the night when there's no traffic. Um, and you can use that smart upload capability to actually be archiving only those videos that are of specific interest, uh, perhaps something that might be needed to do for a, a traffic ac accident reconstruction or something like that. They can s uh, significantly reduce the amount of storage uh, that you that you actually have to archive. It also shows that the location where the processing is occurring is moving out from central data centers and actually moving out to the edge. In this pipeline, we show how to do that in a mobile edge computing location. Uh, we also show how to coordinate multiple mobile edge computing locations using orchestration software. Um, and you could have easily an application that supports, uh, you know, hundreds of cameras in a, in a geography connected through dozens of mobile edge computing platforms that are all coordinated and then feed back in a smart upload fashion uh, to a central uh, archive and repository for, for long-term storage. Uh, you also have the ability to, to do uh, uh, specific encoding on the type of tra uh, 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 traffic footage that you want to store. So you have low level uh, or low quality encoding for that stuff that is used only for you know, just traffic analysis monitoring and use higher quality encoding at a higher bit rate and higher storage for something that might be uh, needed for a traffic accident reconstruction. So this is one example of a use case that is impacting storage by the quantity of the location of where the processing and the computing is being done and the type of uh, computing that needs to be done before that video is actually archived and uploaded. Um, we had, so it sounded like somebody was jumping in on a question. Well, uh, I, was, I was about to, so I'll, I'll ask it here. So in, in addition, it's not just smart storage, it's also smart networking. Uh, you actually need your edge to be intelligent enough to decide when and where to send the information right. in a way that's in a way that's going to make your whole deployment effective. So this is really a lot more than uh, just a video analytics piece or just a storage piece. It's really an intelligent deployment that orchestrates very clearly across the cloud and out to the edge. Yep, the, 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 the networking is part of the overall orchestration piece, and that orchestration um, also includes provisioning of the mobile edge computing platforms, provisioning of the connections to the cameras, and, and connection of the network even out beyond the storage and the computing nodes. Excellent. So as I said, this is um, a, a fully functioning application that can be downloaded from that uh, GitHub repository for the Open Visual Cloud project. We also have a pre-recorded video demo of this application in action with some voiceovers explaining what's going on. Uh, we didn't have the capability to really show that video using the BrightTalk platform, so I put the link into the slides and I encourage you to go to that, uh, to that link and, and take a look at the demonstration of, of what's going on yourself. Mm -hmm. And there was a question that came up while you're switching over, uh, and uh, this really refers to another uh, activity that SNE is very heavily invested in in terms of computational storage. Uh, for those of you not familiar, computational storage is moving some of the compute functions to the storage devices. And there was a question as to whether having more intelligent storage devices, like we were just talking about intelligent networking, Kevin, could also having smart analytics on, on various local stores be a way to be able to uh, enhance the smart city project? Um, so definitely what we have seen is that moving the storage closer to the compute, and, and you'll see an example of that in, in the use case that I'm about to show, um, does have an impact on performance. Whether that compute is next to storage um, or whether you are doing uh, shorter term storage closer to the compute element, as you'll see in this next use case, um, you've got a lot of different options for doing it that way. But the, I think the key fundamental learning is lower the latency between your storage and your compute nodes, and you will see a, a resulting improvement in, 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 uh, in performance. And, and I can give you some metrics in a couple of slides that, 
that talk just about how much. Yeah, and absolutely, and you can do that both ways. You can actually move your you can move your data store to a compute node, or you have the ability to move the compute to the store, or even the compute to the network. And actually, there was a pretty good bright talk that y'all can look up on uh, Compute Everywhere that was recently also done by SNEA. So uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of topics that cover this. I'm really interested to see where you're uh, heading with this next example, Kevin. Sure. So this is the uh, second use case that I'll talk about today. Um, it's published under the Open Visual Cloud Project as a library curation, but it's really an encapsulation of a project that's been going on uh, as a collaboration between Intel Labs and a couple of universities, Carnegie Mellon and Stanford, for a large-scale video processing system. And there's several components to this that, that show how large-scale video analytics really impacts storage. Um, on the the, the right hand the left hand side, you see a project there called GStreamer, and that is a a way of using the GStreamer framework to be able to build a pipeline that can do analytics on large numbers of cameras that are feeding into a central store. Um, but below that, you see a project called Scanner, which is a partnership with Stanford, that does the same. Uh, the, the same thing on large video stored libraries. And then Intel's contribution to this is a video database management system, which is a new style of database that um, is optimized to handle both the storage of the video itself as well as the metadata around that video, including the ability to do graph-based uh, uh, metadata and queries to do better scene understanding of what's going on in the video that's being processed. Um, these are partnerships that are also published on GitHub. The, the, the overall VDMS system is published on GitHub. Uh, there is an integration of this in a example that I'll show in the next slide partner, uh, published under the Open Visual Cloud Project. And then I'll show you some examples of where Stanford has been doing some work to publish the results of their scanner uh, implementation. But basically, this is all about a pipeline that is that is working on large numbers of cameras and or video libraries that are coming in. We've seen um, specific use cases in the industry that uh, that customers are getting that are getting started in in, in 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 looking at. One example is studios beginning to look at this type of system as a way of processing the large amount of video libraries that they have, either through their uh, you know the the, the the, the production works that they've been working on over time, or in many cases, the libraries of videos that they have acquired through acquisition of companies. And they need an efficient way of analyzing those libraries to figure out what's in them, um, how they might be able to monetize them. So they're looking at doing scene understanding, scene understanding facial recognition to understand which actors or actresses are in those videos, um, and then also similarity analysis to be able to, to look at what kind of videos work well together as they start to package these, con these, uh, these video properties up into um, aggregate packages and streams. We've given an example of how to, 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 uh, to do this in the library creation sample application. And this is an example of the interface that shows how you're actually using uh, the interface to build a query For um, for real time, and I'm, I'm I'm a little bit distracted because I am trying to actually show a real time video clip, and I'm a little confused by the Bright Talk interface on how <laughs> to choose the screen and the window that I'm looking for. Uh, you hit that screen share there on your side. While you're while you're bringing that up, uh, the the my understanding is that a lot of the video studios are also potentially using this for copyright management. Uh, they have the ability to actually identify some of the key meta pieces, and then they can use that to be able to search uh, some of the open channels, YouTube and, other, and elsewhere, to determine if any of their content is actually being pirated or used at, outside of their authority. That's right, and this is a, a good example of uh, the use of that, that uh, the GStreamer pipeline for uh, bringing in large streaming, um, uh, large screaming inputs. And uh, let me just check and see if the if what I'm trying to show is actually coming across. Ought to be able. Okay, good. It looks like there it so. Is. This is an, this is an example of um, using that library creation sample application. It's a, it's a fairly simple user interface, but it can be used to build fairly complex queries. 
And on the right-hand side, what we're seeing is the result of a query where you're looking for horses with two people, exactly two people. Um, in the two video windows, you see the, the full video clip that's been sped up at, at 4x real time, so you can see the entire video clip as I talk through it. And on the right-hand side, just the short video segments that have satisfied the results of the query. And these can be presented either as a concatenated video or as short segments that are returned and perhaps put into the VDMS database system uh, for, for storing the, the video and the metadata around that. You can combine this um, in the application with facial recognition to identify who are the people that are in the video clips. You can build more complex queries as far as number of horses or combination of horses and cars or horses without cars. Uh, things like that can be done. And this is an example of the type of complex query that can be performed, in fact, needs to be performed to satisfy some of the requirements for, um, for this kind of use case. And the, the other point I'd like to make is that in order to achieve these objectives, we're seeing the use of a lot of different types of tools and types of databases in order to actually accomplish the result. The VDMS project uh, and the overall library creation sample is built around a collection of open source tools, um, traditional and non-traditional databases, as well as some special customized databases that uh, allow for storing of graph-based uh, databases and, and graph-based scene decomposition. And so these are changing the kind of computation that's being applied. The result is a, a significant increase in the number of compute cycles that are being applied to storage. And that's one of the reasons for the use of, um, of specialized architectures like the VDMS structure. So there's a lot of room for improvement in this over time. As we get new tools, they can be pretty easily integrated into the system. You've made it an open enough interface that you can actually bring in new analytics tools and new data stores to be able to enhance the, the quality of the, of, the overall, uh, of the overall piece, correct? That's right. And in addition, we've also provided the capability for users to insert their own uh, deep learning models to support um, additional types of video processing um, beyond what we're currently supporting. Um, and so while all of these examples are built upon some of the open source models that you see in the industry, um, the pipeline certainly um, incorporates through our open Vino tool the ability to import additional models uh, that can be optimized to run on um, any hardware platform, whether that's a, you know, a, a CPU, a standard CPU, or an accelerator, or GPU, or specialized workload accelerator. But some of the reasons that we're moving to these specialized databases um, are really shown by this screen. And what this shows is the speed up in using a VDMS query with a specialized graph-based storage and database over and above um, standard processing for various complexities of queries, you know, looking for just a, a metadata and images with alligator or with alligator and then doing resizing of that image um, or various other complex video processing on that. And then even more complex, like looking for alligators or lakes or alligators and lakes. And as you can see, um, particularly for some of the more uh, complex queries, you can see some significant speed up improvements over doing this using traditional straight database um, and traditional, traditional compute capabilities. On top of this, um, we talked about the impact of where the memory is stored. And we have additional data that I don't have on this slide, unfortunately, that shows that you can achieve an additional 40% improvement on average um, by using data stores that are very close to the compute cluster. And this is an example of bringing compute and storage close together. Um, in this particular example, we, we measure the impact of system non-volatile memory, system NVMe, um, which is actually populated in the DIMMs close to the CPU and very, so as a result, very low latency to the compute cluster. And by just doing the processing from that system NVMe, we can achieve an additional 40% improvement in performance over and above what we're seeing here. Um, to get the, you may be thinking, well, this is all great. This is all, you know, a forward-looking, you know, example. It's, 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 it's kind of in the future. Um, I want to give you some real-time examples, some, some, some uh, real-world examples of where this is being used. A couple of that have been published. One, the Brown Institute Media Innovation has used this system um, to do audiovisual analysis of about 10 years' worth of TV news. 
Um, Facebook is using this as part of their surround 360 pipeline. Um, and these are all using the scanner component of the, of the system. And then one that you can actually get your hands on and play with is Stanford's cable TV news analyzer, which was announced over the summer, and there will be links to that in the next slide. They've put that uh, 10 years of TV news archival footage online and allow you to run various queries over that. The example graph that is shown here on the slide is looking for mentions in news of Trump versus Biden over the last 10 years. And so you can see significant uh, increases in mentions of Trump during the presidency, but mentions of Biden as we get closer to the election. And so this is an example of being able to use um, a, a, a real-time system like this to do real-time analysis. People have begun to, to use this project to do things for, to, to look at things like, uh, do we have equitable representation of males versus females in TV news anchors in the industry? And they're, they're actually able to show how that has changed over time, uh, over the past 10 years. And so this is a, a project you can actually get your hands on, play with, and see how it actually works in, in real time. And as I said, um, I promised some, some links to where uh, you can get your hands on and, and actually play with these. The Open Visual Cloud project is hosted on GitHub. Oop. That went forward once. Uh, the Visual Data Management System is on GitHub. There's also a, a paper describing it on Archive. The Scanner project, uh, same. Uh, like we got an auto advance is getting in my way here. And then links for the Open Vino Toolkit, which is a key part of our, 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 our tool chain. And then the uh, TV News Cable TV Analyzer project at Stanford in the link. These are all uh, live links that will be in the, in, the screen, uh, in the slides as you download them. Yeah, and, so as a that, reminder, the, and as a reminder, you can download the attachment. And I see several people already have. But uh, you can, uh, under the attachments bar, these slides are available. So you can click on the links there and go directly to the information. Okay, with that, I'll turn things back over to Jim and Glenn um, and let them take it forward. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so we've heard some, some incredibly interesting use cases of, of how we're using video and how we're wrapping analytics around video to drive value. So understanding what's in the video, understanding the impact it's having on the environment around it and all those sorts of things. So if we look at the, the kind of architecture I presented at the beginning, obviously that's not gonna cope and, uh, and it is quite an old architecture. So what we're beginning to see is, is what we're seeing now. And when you look at the camera fleet, the first noticeable thing is that inference of analytics is now happening on device itself, so at the camera layer. Um, that could be attached to the camera itself or it could be right beside the camera. Um, from a storage perspective, that often means that there needs to be some kind of caching layer that goes there as well. Because if that inference slows down for whatever reason, what you want to be able to do is make sure you don't miss frames that, that are going by as well. So you, you're caching into a... Um, potentially even uh, a computational storage device that sits near there and does that computation as it comes off camera. So firstly, the, the inference is moving to the edge and moving to those devices. That presents a couple of problems or a couple of challenges, I should say, in terms of being able to manage the model distribution to that. And you can see that represented here by that purple dotted line. That's a distribution of models that you've created going out to those, uh, to those cameras. Because as we know, models decline over time. As we go through um, more training and as we go through more um, reiteration of those models, um, we, we get better at them and we need to redistribute those to the camera to be able to sort of bring them back in. Um, as we move to the left, you can see some, some differences in this part of the ecosystem as well. We now have a video management system. Now this can do all of those uh, interesting things that Kevin was talking around, including the sort of metadata indexing, the, the, the databases and the graph databases that's at within that, that talk about the relationships between videos, um, as well as just the managing of where the streams are headed. So whether they're going out to a, um, an archive or whether they're going into uh, a kind of an operator's room. Wherever it happens, it's happening now at the digital layer. So it, it's able to be overlaid. Now if that inference on the camera is actually adding artifacts to the video, for example, bounding boxes around features of interest, that will then be displayed on the operator screen. And so drawing their attention to things that they need to be looking at. Um, that's embedded into that stream then. What we might want to do is, is change the use of that video. So that might be being sent as a separate layer so that that can be removed from the video and we keep the raw footage as well. There's lots of different ways of kind of doing this type of encoding. What it means though is if we're sending more layers across, we're, we're obviously consuming more storage as well. So you need that, that sort of core data center storage to be expanded to be able to cope with those new use cases too. 
as we move into that kind of digital archive, which is that big pool, we're going to be using that for a lot more than just storing the data and then possibly bringing it back if there's an event we need to know more about or we need to uh, maybe provide as evidence or whatever it is we're, we're using the use case for. And so we plug into that. Um, new training capabilities. So you, you could possibly have a data scientist that will be pulling that in and, and building new models, or you could be leveraging off-the-shelf models, or you could be leveraging off-the-shelf applications and systems. Um, when you're doing that, what you do is you pull in from the archive, and then you can train new use cases based on that data, or refine the models you already have. Um, so you may have public model, publicly available models that you start with, and want to refine it refine it based on maybe the lighting that's in the scenarios that you're particularly focused on. I mentioned the public transport earlier. One of the things that was very impactful there was cameras are often in very dark areas on public transport. So they're looking at um, something that, that might be in a stairwell or looking at something that might be poorly lit on a bus, for example. Uh, and so being able to retrain models to take um, account of those sorts of changes means you'll get better and better performance as you get more and more data that's, that's capable of being pushed into that. Um, you also may want to then detect other types of objects. We went through a project recently that detected um, things like buggies, so uh, baby carriages and, and wheelchairs on buses. Uh, and the reason we're doing that is because we're making sure that the buses have capacity for them. But that wasn't something that was publicly available as the model, at least not in the context that we needed it. And so more training was done, and we could then go back over old footage and get historical data around that just by injecting that new model into it. So you have the whole inference engine that sits within your data center as well and does inference against the archive, as well as being able to push that model out to those cameras so that you, your new capability can happen in real time as well. Maybe it's there to let the driver know that we've counted this many buses, uh, this many um, baby carriages that have come onto the bus, possibly unseen if they're coming on via a rear door, um, and so there's no more room, uh, or that one has now exited until you now have more room, that, that kind of inference. Um, but as you can see, there's, there's a much more complicated pipeline of things. And if we expand that further and start looking at the graph database that sit in there, <coughs> excuse me, the metadata management systems that sit in there, it becomes a very complicated ecosystem of devices that we now have to manage. So just to kind of reiterate on that, inference now is happening at the edges, not that just at the cameras, but also the near edge as well. So as it's come off the camera into a potential cache, we then have more compute power available to us than we would have on maybe the, the low power device that's attached to the camera. So we can do a secondary pass of that information. One of the use cases for that might be to do refinement of the model. Um, I worked with an organization that was um, looking at uh, preventing traffic crime. Uh, and they wanted to pass information about uh, vehicles that were of interest that were detected by one camera to prime other cameras to be able to detect them more, more quickly. So um, identify the, the license plate to other cameras as well so they knew what to pick up. Um, if the license plate uh, of the car color had changed, for example, which often happens when plates are moved around, that new information and metadata was shared to those other cameras as well so they knew what to pick up. So being able to do that firstly on the camera to get a, a prompt for that, but then with secondary inference that, that kind of sits nearby is, is very useful. That means we need um, more processing power and storage, either on or near the device, or processing power on the storage, in the case of computational storage. Um, we're digitally birthing all of this video. It's being created by IP cameras and, and high-quality cameras whose output is digital by its very nature, which means what we're getting is much higher quality but also much denser in storage because we're getting those multiple layers, including if you're then starting to overlay um, interesting artifacts, to, so, so bounding boxes and those sorts of things, um, as well as the rest of the metadata that is streaming with it. We might have the metadata about the video, so where it's being captured, the circumstances under which it's being captured, and the triggers as to why it's being captured, which we can then use to filter. So as uh, Kevin mentioned, we don't have to send everything back to the data center, but also the metadata then around what we'll be detecting within the, um, within the frame, the objects that we're detecting, and possibly even their actions. Another project I'm working on that's looking at things like actions and metadata management of those is looking at sporting events. So for example, soccer or football as we call it properly in the UK. Um, with, those, uh, with that type of thing we're doing that is, is using frames and animation of frames to identify what the activity is that's going on. So that could be somebody making a tackle, it could be somebody scoring a goal, it could be a foul. Um, we're identifying the event that is happening within the, the sport. And so we're laying metadata on over that. So if you're looking to do that for broadcast, for example, you can immediately place down markers on a live broadcast so that you can go back and view what's happened. It could be that there's a yellow card given or a booking or, or whatever it may be. Um, that firstly enhances the, the experience of the people that are viewing it immediately because they get richer data and, and be able to go back and forth to, to various parts of it. 
But if you then combine that with things like natural language processing to simulate voice, you can start doing commentary for those that don't have perfect vision and so may not be able to enjoy the game properly. And if you can do that within the stadium and play that through the device, that's another experience boost for people that get to want to go and attend those events but don't necessarily have the eyesight or the, um, the ability to really understand what's going on on their own. And rather than have their friends sort of commentate throughout the thing, they can have devices that do that for them. So these are the sorts of use cases that those larger data sets and that archive or that coming together of metadata enable. And finally, there's the governance. And I'm going to go into a bit more detail on the governance in a minute because this is becoming a, a hot topic. Um, not just the governance of the digital data itself, but also of all of the data that sits around it and the metadata that sits around it, particularly when you start looking at people within video and start maybe identifying people within video as well. And is there really a need to do that sort of thing? So if we step into to governance in a little bit more detail, the first, as I said, the first red flag is anything that's personally identifiable information that sits within those video frames means we need to be cautious about the way we store it and the way we protect it. That could be people's faces, especially if it's within an organization that links their identity to maybe an HR record or something like that. It could be something as simple as you've detected a letter in somebody's bag and it has a name and address on it. All of these things need to be coped with uh, under certain circumstances. And there's legislation in many countries that force you to do that type of detection and manage that in different ways. Then there's the use of facial detection versus facial recognition. Now, this is a, a bit of a battle that's going on in the space at the moment. And many organizations uh, that are starting off in this space and are trying to get to market quickly will go with facial recognition algorithms as a way of detecting that there's a human being in there. Um, what it tends to mean is that there's also other use cases to wrap around the facial recognition piece. Um, security in, in the workplace, for example, is one of those. Uh, but what it means is you're capturing data that can personally identify that person, which means you have to treat the whole stream in a different way uh, because you now have personally identifiable information and you now have the means to identify a person. Whether you've done it or not, and whether you've turned it on or not, if the capability exists, you have to treat the stream in a different way. Facial detection, on the other hand, is meaning I've detected that a face is within the, the picture, but I'm not, I've got no means of figuring out who that is. I don't have contextual information, and I'm not necessarily associating the features or landmarks that I've discovered, such as a pair of eyes and a nose. I know that's a face, but I don't know whose face it is, and I'm not capturing enough information to be able to do that. So facial detection means you can treat it in a different way than if you've actually got facial recognition going on. The other part is you may end up with things like trade secrets being leaked or baked into the inference model itself. As you're training the inference models, you need to be very careful about the training data that you're using because things may be captured in the frame or things that you're training to detect, so the features you're particularly picking, may contain information that gets revealed if other people get to reverse engineer your model. So you need to be very careful about what it is you're filming, what it is you're training, and where that model ends up. Um, people forget that if you start distributing those models, it's not just a series of weights. The, the series of weights can lead to other conclusions about how it was trained, the types of data that you trained on, those sorts of things. And we're, we're beginning to see a little bit more care being taken around how do we treat the data that's being used for training and how do we treat the, um, the, the artifacting and the model that comes after that. Finally, we want to have model and analytical transparency, particularly when predictions are made, and very particularly when it's about people. Why did the model make this particular decision? Why did it identify this particular item? Uh, and how did it come to the conclusion that the event that was taking place is the actual event? There's going to be more and more legislation comes out around that as we see more and more court cases spring up from actions being taken either by law enforcement or by uh, organizations against an individual or a group of people um, or even an item, uh, like lost baggage within an airport, for example, um, as more and more people find they're, they're being impacted by AI uh, and video analytics in the public and in the wild, you're going to see more legislation come and start looking at protection and how things can be wrapped up. The other part of that is, as you capture data, you're capturing it for a reason. If you look at things like in the UK, we have something called the Data Protection Act. The same legislation exists in slightly different forms in most uh, countries. But what it means is you're capturing data for a particular reason. If you then start training models using that data for a different reason, you're actually breaching that, that act usually because you're then changing the methods for which you're using the data. Now, there are things you can do in terms of the, um, the agreements you have when you're collecting that data, the notifications you give the members of the public or the members of your staff or whatever it is you're capturing. Um, there's things you can do to, to kind of mitigate against that, but you have to bear in mind that things that were captured historically on the ancient systems that I talked about might not be able to be used for the training that you want it to be used for anyway. You have to check the legislation and the, the means by which it was captured and the reasons it was captured. And finally, we have the, the who can see what, including things like right to be forgotten. 
So you need to be able to understand that when well, you have all this captured video in your archive, who can then go through that video and see it? Do you have um, people that are looking for particular individuals in there, that maybe they're friends and they want to uh, tease them about something that happened or, or that, that was captured on film? Or uh, do you have people looking for a certain type of person? Um, and then there's, if you've been captured on video, how can you go and find that out? And how can you do things like, I want every video of me to be deleted? And that could mean facial recognition. Now, there might not be facial recognition on the inference side at the edge, as we looked at. You might want to build that into your archive, for example, to say, this person has come up. So Glenn stood up to me and said, I don't want any videos of me being held and recorded. Um, I've got the right to be forgotten because I'm in Europe, for example. And then train a model using my pictures of my face that I provide to you to go and detect all instances of me in your video and remove them. So facial detection isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it has to be used in the right way and for the good of the people that are being filmed. So we're going to see a lot more of this governance sort of come out around video analytics and the things we're doing with it, particularly in public spaces and particularly when it involves people. So I would think there's going to be a couple of, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of back and forth on that. There's, you know, obviously you and I in prior Bright Talks have talked about, you know, the work that we both do with law enforcement. And there are certain archive requirements around police body cameras or dashboard cameras or other things like that. But I would think in a smart city environment where you've got cameras, uh, if there is a uh, legal or a, a public emergency issue, that you're going to be very interested in ensuring that the cameras pointed on the street and other things are equally archivable and searchable uh, as potential evidence or uh, or potential investigative uh, uh, tools. So there's a lot of back and forth on. Okay, I you know I have the ability to not see that video, but that video might be used in a, in a court case at some point. Are you still there, Glenn? We might have lost Glenn. Uh, yeah, he is in the uh, UK, and uh, there's, a, there's a potential occasionally for uh, cell phones disconnecting. The other question that I was going to ask that's uh, come through, and, uh, and Kevin, I don't know whether you've uh, stepped on this uh, at, uh, at any point in your organization, but um, have, one of the things uh, that's, uh, that's known pretty well about digital pickups is they actually see well beyond the human spectrum into infrared and ultraviolet. And have you seen any uses for uh, you know, beyond human vision, uh, starting to come into metadata tags or other things in, in your uh, work? Probably the best example I can think of is uh, near and dear to this time in the increasing use of the infrared for temperature monitoring uh, as people come into uh, a building or an environment uh, for remote temperature taking, um, a way to satisfy some of the legal requirements on COVID screening that are being enacted all across the world. And so, yes, particularly on infrared, we are seeing much more use of that in the, in the data that we're seeing. Yeah, I mean, so obviously, and, you know, so those of you in the audience, you know, uh, remember that there is a lot of value in data in, in some of these very, you know, in, in some of the technology that's available here. And uh, it goes beyond what we see or what we think, you know, pun intended. And uh, I understand that Glenn is back, so Glenn, I'll hand it back to you for the summary. Thanks about Sorry about that. Uh, Skype seemed to be having a bad day, or at least giving me a bad day. Um, actually, an interesting point around the um, the temperature detection piece from the infrared piece. You're right. The, we're seeing that get rolled out a lot. Um, one of the things that I've I've seen from other organisations that are, are kind of doing this, and the way um, organisations are presenting it to their customers as well, um, also has some some odd governance issues in the sense that I've seen it shown as a COVID detection system which obviously it's not doing. It's, it's just detecting that the temperature might be slightly different for any number of reasons. Uh, and so I've, I've seen them fall foul of people like the FCA coming along and saying, you can't say that because that's a medical statement you're making uh, and it simply isn't possible. So um, just how we present video analytic systems to the members of the, our organizations and the public can also land us in hot water if we're not careful about exactly what's going on in that, in that system. Um, so just to, to kind of wrap up very quickly as a summary, um, Video analytics is obviously providing great value to organizations in lots of different ways, not just in the bits that we've been talking about or I've been talking around from a, um, a public perspective, but the great use cases Keith has talked about when, uh, sorry, Kevin's been talked about when um, we're looking at sort of using it against video archives for um, 
movies, for uh, TV, uh, and, and frame detection, all those sorts of things. Um, we're starting to, to leverage traditional data sets as well, but it is harder. There is value in it, though, particularly when I've talked about the sort of public transport examples. Um, combining those video analytics with other types of analytics, so if we look at the, the examples where we had um, all of the, the kind of relations of the frames of people with two people on horses, those sorts of things. If we start bringing all that together and bringing contextual information against that as well, we have a very rich archive to be able to dig into and get specific types of data back. Um, if you're using it, for example, for video quality assurance and you're um, maybe filming the blades of a wind farm and, and seeing how they behave and how the, the wind is affecting them and whether blunt edges are causing them to wobble or those sorts of things. Adding contextual information to those sorts of things as well really gives you a, a rich archive to dive into. Uh, and combining that with other telemetry means you can start interpreting what's going on in those images in much more uh, in rich ways. Um, this requires a cognitive ability moving at machine speeds, though. You can't have humans doing this anymore. Um, we've been good at it up until this point, but it's gone way beyond the scale of human beings being able to, um, to match machines now. Machines, from a, a cognitive perspective, are, are equal or beyond what humans are usually. Um, the video ecosystem is growing, and it's becoming much more complicated, though. The, ar the architecture that I showed is just a subset of those pieces that can be in there, and it's becoming very extensible and very easy to plug new capabilities into. We've already kind of explored a lot of that um, within this uh, webcast. You can see that that's a, a kind of burgeoning area. Um, what it means, though, is we have to manage the life cycle of all of the software and the devices and everything that sits within that ecosystem. Having the versions right of the models across all of those cameras, making sure the firmware on all of those cameras is the same so the feeds we get off them are uniform. All of these are things we need to start thinking about. Um, but everything comes back to storage because we're SNEA, uh, and it's all pushing data growth even further than ever before. It's only ever going to get bigger. It's only going to uh, increase. And so we really need to start thinking about how do we start bringing technology to, A, cope with that, using things like metadata filtering, but also things like compression, also things like computational storage, so we can do more at the edge and not need to bring things back to the data center. So all of this comes together to, to give us a, um, a kind of new way of, of looking at video and how it's going to impact us from an infrastructure perspective. So I'll hand back to uh, Jim to close out. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, you certainly taught this old video hack a, a fair amount of stuff today, and I would imagine that the audience is equally educated. Um, for the audience, we would love to uh, know uh, how educational this was. So uh, you see that rate uh, button right below the screen there. Please make sure to rate the webcast, provide us comments with feedback. Again, we use your feedback to improve not only uh, the content that we have here, but to look for future content. So if you have other suggestions that you would like to see around analytics, video analytics, or uh, any other IoT applications, we would be happy to, to work with you on that. Um, this webcast and a copy of the slides will be available at the SNEA Educational Library, and you can see the link there. Again, you can download the, uh, uh, this PDF of this deck uh, immediately here. And a Q&A of this webcast will be posted at the SNEA Cloud blog. Uh, you can follow us at the SNEACloud.com. Uh, and if you're a Twitter follower, make sure to follow us at SNEA Cloud on Twitter. We certainly appreciate all of your time today. Uh, Glenn, Kevin, thank you very much for the informational presentation. And thank you, audience, for listening. We look forward to seeing you in another Bright Talk presentation.